Uh, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I know this is a typical um, Palm Sunday sermon. That's a joke because that's not usually what you do. Usually on a Palm Sunday, we go to one of the Gospels and we go through one of the accounts of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, um, which we will touch on. But um, today I wanted to talk about this passage because the purpose of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was he was coming there to be crucified. Now, no one knew that at the time. Many of the Jews believed that he was coming in and there to overthrow Rome, to overtake his political power there. And that's what they believed. But Jesus was actually coming to save those that were lost and including those people there. And so Acts chapter 10, we've been going through the book of Acts in young adults on Friday nights. And we just read about Paul's conversion or Saul's conversion before his name was changed on the road to Damascus. And we were going into um, Peter and his ministry. And we're starting to look more at what Peter's going to be doing in the next couple of chapters. And so for context here, if you go back to Acts chapter 9, verse 43, just the last verse of the chapter, it says, so it was that, they, that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Now, I'm going to ask you guys today to put on your, your Jewish hats, your yarmulkes, because we need, to, we need to think like a Jewish person when we're reading these specific texts today. And the reason for that is because there's some um, laws that seem to be broken here by Jewish custom, by Peter. There are, uh, there's uncleanliness going on, and there's a change over from the apostles realizing that Jesus is not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles, us unwashed swine Gentiles, right? And that's what this is for. And so the uh, Lord is going to reveal that to Peter in this passage. So he's in Joppa by the sea with a guy named Simon, a tanner. Now, again, if you're a Jew and you read this, you say, why is Peter, a Jewish person, hanging around a tanner? Well, what do tanners do? Well, they take dead animal skin, they make it into clothes and blankets and different kind of things. Well, if you were around dead animals, you had a seven-day unclean period where you couldn't go to the temple, you couldn't worship, you couldn't do these things. So you're already starting to see Peter's like kind of stepping over the rope here where he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm going in. I, I know the Lord's doing something different, but I know this isn't quite the right thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyways. And uh, before he heals someone um, from this place, and so this is why he's out here. And so he's in Joppa, and we're seeing the Lord starting to change his heart. Now, I am very blessed by the life of Peter. The reason why is because Peter messes up a lot, you know, and that is encouraging for me. Um, as a young 24-year-old man, I have made my fair share of mistakes, right? Um, very immature and dumb. But Peter was the person who um, Jesus told him to get behind me, Satan, right? He denied the Christ three times in front of him, and uh, he, he seemed to be a very stubborn, stubborn person. But he also has great moments, right, where Peter says, you know, who do you say I am? And he says, well, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, you know, heaven and earth have uh, earth has not revealed this, but heaven has revealed this to you. My God has revealed this to you. And many times you see him preach sermons like in Acts chapter 2 and on Solomon's porch in Acts chapter 4 and getting arrested and standing for Jesus. So he has his good moments and he has his bad moments. We're going to see both of those in this section as well. And so this hard-hearted person, Peter, which Peter or Simon means pebble or rock. Uh, my middle name is Peter and my first name is Isaac. So my name means laughing rock just for context. It's a very, very good name. I like it. Um, but he's stubborn. He's a very stubborn person. He's, you know, set in his ways, wants to do this thing. You can remember after Jesus is resurrected and what are the, or when Jesus dies, the first thing they do, they want to start going fishing again, right? They just go back, they get back to the old, old jobs and do what they know how to do. So this is Peter. Now we're going to be introduced to another guy. His name's Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verse 1, it says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, or some um, translation for the Italian co cohort, which is just a, a, a big group of soldiers. It says, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to people and prayed to God always. So this is a Gentile Roman, non-Jewish person who became a proselyte Jew, kind of entered into Judaism. Seems like here we can't tell, but likely he was uncircumcised, which is kind of one of the requirements to come into Judaism. But he was someone who prayed to the Lord. He followed the Jewish customs, and he tried to obey the God. This is someone seeking out the Lord 
and getting pushed away by religion saying you have to do these certain things to come to know me, to come to know the Lord. And so it says him and his whole household, they gave alms generally, generously. He's in a place, Caesarea, which is like a Roman stronghold in Israel. It's where um, Augustus built a, 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 like a castle temple for himself there. And uh, there was kind of like a stronghold, I said, in Israel. And he was a leader over an Italian regiment. There's about um, it seems to be about 6,000 soldiers plus in these regiments. So, you know, pretty high up commander. He's not some low guy in the totem pole. He's a pretty, pretty um, powerful person in the, in, uh, in the um, Roman Empire. And so it says, and he prayed to God always. Verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, which is uh, 3 p.m., I saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming. Um, oh, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen an angel appear before me before. But if I saw something like that, I would be very afraid as well, right? We tend to think of angels as like, you know, little Cupid flying around, you know, something like that. We see in the little children's books, you know, they're really pretty. You know, the Bible describes angels in different contexts in Revelation. In one, one section, it describes a certain angel with eyes all over its body and uh, you know, eight wings, two to cover his face, two to cover their feet, two to cover body, one to fly, you know, all this kind of stuff. So we don't really know what they look like. All I'm saying is if an angel appeared before us, you and I would also be afraid, right? Many times in Scripture, we see an angel appears before people and they are afraid. You think of Joshua when the Lord's, uh, when the, Lord's uh, um, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. He was afraid and the angel has to say, do not be afraid. Or in Daniel chapter 10, when an angel of the Lord comes to him, he has to say, the angel has to say, do not be afraid. So many times, the angel says, do not be afraid. The most well-known one, Mary, when she was, you know, the Virgin Mary, when she was at her home, and an angel appeared to her and said, do not be afraid, for you are God's chosen. You're going to take on this task of uh, um, birthing the Messiah. And so, again, a scary sight usually comes with do not be afraid. But the angel doesn't do that here. Listen, listen to what it says. It says, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, the angel, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. This is a comforting sign from someone, right? Someone who's seeking God, doesn't know if what he's doing is the right way, can't go to the temple, can't, you know, do certain things. He's, he's likely uncircumcised, trying to understand, am I, can I be a Jew if I'm not born a Jew, but I want to serve the Lord? And the angel says, hey, your prayers have come up like a memorial before God, your alms. What a comforting thing to know, man. Hey, God hears you. God understands what you're going through. God, God hears you. And then again, this is showing the sign when, when the veil was torn in two. Hebrews 4, 16 tells us that we can now come boldly before the throne room of grace. We no longer have to go to a priest. We don't have to go to confession. We don't have to, you know, uh, ask St. Peter to tell God a, ne a message for us. That's not what we have to do. We just come. Anywhere we're at, we're driving our car on our knees in our room, making dinner, whatever we're doing, we can just say, hey, Lord, here's, here's my request. Here's, here's my heart. And you can just share with the Lord, and he will um, make it clear to you what he has. And so, again, this angel comforts Cornelius. says, now send men to Joppa, verse 5 of Acts 10, and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when they had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So he gets a command and he immediately goes, okay, you guys need to go here. I need to send my soldier here. You guys need to go and do this thing. This is an example of obedience, right? My mom growing up, always repeat this phrase, it will be ingrained, ingrained in my brain for the rest of my life without complaint, without delay, right? When I tell you something, don't, no, mom, you know, without complaint, without delay. How many times do we as Christians complain, Lord, you, you can't be serious. This is not something you would want me to do. This is not something that is supposed to happen. But when he calls you to do something, look at this example of someone who just can, does it and gets it done super fast. And now we're going to see the apostle Peter's response, which is a little different than this guy's response, Okay. Verse 9, it says, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, um, which is uh, the sixth hour is noon. So the Jewish clock, just so you know, 6 a.m. is zero. 
and then from there you count on uh, forward. So sixth hour would be noon. It says, verse 10, then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. I can relate. But while they made it ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound on four corners descending to him, uh, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. For you hunters out there, this is a great verse to memorize, you know, rise, kill, and eat. Peter, again, putting your Jewish brain, your Jewish yarmulke on, you have to think, he's now looking at all these unclean animals that are not kosher according to the law in the Old Testament. He couldn't eat these things. And a voice of God is saying, rise, kill, and eat. That's a conflict, right? Your whole life, you're taught one thing, and you do one thing your whole life, and then God just comes in and says, nope, we're going to do something different. This is what we're going to do. And then this is how Peter responds. But Peter said, not so, Lord, right? He's going to go back to get behind me, Satan, in a, in a minute. This is, what, this is what Jesus might have said, but he didn't. He says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. The Lord speaks to Peter, and what does he do? No, I'm not going to do that. Right away. The Lord speaks to Cornelius, boom, instant obedience. I think that sometimes as Christians, we, we, we think, you know, we kind of put God in a box, I guess you can say. We think, God wouldn't do it that way. He wouldn't use me in that area. You know, I, I talked to many people being in, in youth ministry and young adults for many years. You know, yeah, I'm not good with kids, so I'm not called to youth ministry. Okay, that could be true. That could be right. If you're not good with kids and kids don't like you, don't join us, right? We don't, we don't, we don't want that. But maybe the Lord's calling you to go out of your comfort zone to, to experience with these kids. Most of them, they don't like Junior hires, but Brady's cool. I like him. He's, he's, he's not as crazy. Um, we're also wearing the same, kind of the same shirt today, dude. Well, not really the same color. Brian, too, in the back. It's kind of sick. We planned it. Um, but we see Peter's first response again here is, hey, not so, Lord. And a voice again spoke to him a second time saying, Peter, how dare you? No, that's not what he said. That's what I would have said. He says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. The grace of God in our lives, when we're stubborn, and we're being, you know, a bunch of dummies, being, being a disobedient, rebellious, just the grace of his response to us, constantly being gracious. You know, many times I can now look, my son just started walking uh, uh, the last couple of weeks, right? And I can relate to this analogy now. I hear people say all the time, yeah, when your son starts walking and he falls on the ground, you don't go, Poof, stupid, get up, come on, figure it out. It's not what we say, right? That would be very mean, <laughs> and my wife would hit me, and that wouldn't be fun. But, no, you say, oh, it's okay, buddy. Come on, get back up, get back up. And that's how God is with us. And we tend to think that we're like the older adults and we're very smart. And, you know, I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. Or, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor's kid and I'm a this or that, whatever. And God just sees us as little kids, right? And all we're doing is just reaching our hand, you know, daddy, daddy, help. And God every time is going to help us and just grab us and reach down for us. And so, you know, that's, that's God's heart for us. He's not, he treats us as like, how we deserve to be treated in the sense of that we're just his children. We're adopted, as we sang this morning, into his uh, family, and we need his help. And this says this. This was done three times. Three times. Very important. Men in this room. I don't know if I'm the only one. This is usually about how many times my wife needs to tell me to do something before I'm like, oh, yeah, I need to, I need to do that, you know. Sometimes it's out of rebellion, I will say. I need to repent. Sometimes it's because I'm distracted with other things, so I'm not the, the worst person in the world. But three times he tells Peter, he has to get this in his head, three times. Come on, Peter, this is what I'm telling you. I'm changing something in your life. Verse 17, sorry, finish verse 16. And the object was taken up into heaven again, verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision, which he had seen, meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Okay. When we, many times, I, I believe as Christians, at least for myself, I don't know about you guys, I pray, Lord, can you just give me vision, give me direction, where to go, how to do things? And 
and I just want to know, what, what's my job supposed to be, you know, before I married my wife? Who am I supposed to marry? How many kids should I have? Where should I live? What should I do? What kind of hobby should I do? What kind of ministry should I join? We have all these questions. And sometimes God just tells you to take the next step. Hey, I want you to go here. Well, that doesn't answer my question, Lord. If you can remember back in Acts, I forget the chapter, but it's, uh, I believe it's Acts, I want to say 15, 14 or 15, maybe 16. Uh, Paul is wandering around in, in, in northern Europe, and he's wandering around, uh, and he's going to and from from place, and they hike 20 miles, and he goes, okay, here, Lord, and the Spirit goes, no, don't preach the gospel there. You go, okay, okay, next town, you know, another 20, 30 miles. Here, Lord, no, don't preach the gospel here. And then they go 100 miles. And then Paul gets a vision of a man in Macedonia, and they say, hey, we're going to go there. Imagine being with Paul's crew. Imagine that being you, going, this guy has no clue where we're going. He's walking around nowhere going, oh, yeah, ah. You know, maybe they think, oh, he's feeling like, I don't feel like preaching the gospel there. I don't feel like doing that, right? But Paul's just listening to the Lord, and he's just taking the next step. And it's unclear, and it's, and it's you know, weird, but this is, this is how God uses it. You see the two visions that we see here. Paul doesn't, I mean, um, the angel of the Lord, the angel doesn't come down to Cornelius and say, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. Believe in him. He doesn't say that. He says, hey, I need you to go send for Simon. And also the Lord's heard your prayers. And then Simon gets this vision of this blanket of unclean things ca- calling common and clean and you can eat now. And they're pondering their hearts. What does this mean? And then the Lord says, hey, there's someone at the door. You're going to have, you're going to go tell them something. Go. What am I going to tell them? Just go. Go figure it out. What do you mean? Just go. That's what the Lord's calling us to do. Just take the next step. Go somewhere. Take a step. We're not going to know the exact plan of everything. This is a little easier for me. My wife is a planner, okay? She wants to plan certain things. We have, you know those, uh, the doorknobs? And you know how you put the baby thing on the doorknob so they can't open it? Well, he was like five months old and she bought those. He can't even stand up yet. And I'm like, wait, what are, she's like, no, for when he, you know, he gets up and he's got to open the door. Because she's a planner. She's planning ahead. We probably didn't need him for two months, at least, but she was playing ahead, and that's how she is, and I thank her for that, because without her, I'd be lost in somewhere right now, but that's why men need wives, but this is what we're saying is, you know, just take that next step. God's asking you, take the next step. Just go and be obedient to what I've commanded you. Verse 21, it says, then Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, yes, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And he said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man who fears God and has all good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. On the next day, Peter went away with them, and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Peter's told, go, doubting nothing. They get to the door. What are you doing here? Little doubt maybe going on in Peter's mind. Like, what? I, I'm trying to understand. Very common. I could see myself doing this thing here. And they say, this is the reason we're here. And again, these are Gentiles. And Peter invites them to stay in his house with them. Again, something that would never happen. You couldn't share a meal with a Gentile, let alone house a Gentile. Normally, you just say, hey, there's a, a room down the road. Go down there and stay there. But you say, no, come stay with us today. And so you see, again, the Lord stirring in their hearts. Verse 24, and the following day, they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And they talked with him, and he went in and found many who had come together. In a culture such as an Islam culture, usually in the Middle East or in other places, um, dreams are very valuable in their religion. They believe Allah speaks to them through many dreams. Many times you could read books about this, about Jesus revealing himself to Islam through dreams and visions of Jesus Christ. Again, same thing like in Cornelius here. It's not coming in saying, I'm Jesus Christ. I died on the cross for your sins. If you believe in me, you'll be saved. Repent. It's usually, hey, um, look for someone tomorrow uh, with a cross around their neck. When they see someone the next day, they have a cross. I'm supposed to talk to you about something. Or, you know, Um, hey, I'm Jesus, whom you're seeking, go search, you know, or something, whatever it is. And they, what happens is, um, I can remember a mission trip, my, my, my parents went on my old church. They went to, I think it's 
Michigan, Deerfield, Michigan, Deer Park, Michigan. Anyway, it's like 99% Muslim population there. They have the call of prayer going out. This is the United States of America, Michigan. They have a call of prayer going out. And what they do is they go door to door. And one time they were going door to door. They went to a house, they knocked on the door, and the, the father answered and he said, we've been expecting you. And they're like, what? He goes, come on in. So they all come in the house, and around the table, there's all, their whole family sitting around this table. And they said, we've all had a dream this week several times that some American missionaries, you know, American people, were going to come and share something with us. We're listening. And they came in, and we got to share the gospel with them. And this is what's happening here. Cornelius gets a vision of the Lord, something sent for this guy. He's got something to tell you. Okay, I'm going to tell everyone I know to come here because this was really important. And they wrap themselves around, a, you know, a table or a courtyard or whatever. And uh, he's like, all right, we're here listening. And Peter comes in and goes, again, Peter has, again, still zero idea what's going on. He knows he's breaking Jewish law. So he knows like, hey, if I tell my friends, I'm going to get in trouble. And we're actually, you can see in Galatians chapter uh, 2, Paul rebukes Peter for, you know, coming back and then kind of separating himself from the Gentiles for a moment because he was afraid of what he received back from the Jewish people. But Peter in this moment is confused, rightfully so. In verse 20, it says, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with, you, with or go to one another's uh, nation. Good, good, uh, good welcome, right? Hey, you know I'm not supposed to be here because it's unclean. Make you feel really good, welcome in the home? No. But he says this, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Okay, Peter's getting it. He's understanding this vision. Hey, Gentiles we think is dirty gross, outcast, you know, Pharisees. If a Gentile walk by, they cover themselves with a cloak so they didn't even have sea or dust from them would fall on them. And they would, they would avoid them at all costs because if they touched them, they'd be unclean. And Peter's understanding here, okay, there's something different going on. Then it says, verse 29, Therefore I came without objection as soon as I, as I was sent for you. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? Verse 30, so Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your, prayers ha your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Now imagine Peter here again. God is hearing Gentile prayers. Now this is new. This is interesting. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 32, send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in a house of Simon a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. This is crazy. This is a, if this happened in our life, your brain would explode. This is the craziest thing. Two separate visions coming together, God bringing people together for the purpose of his will. And Peter's there, and he's just like, tell us what God told you. And he's like, all right, and then Peter, again, like I said, he, a light bulb went off. He goes, common or unclean? Oh, yeah, I remember Jesus, like, was going to die for the world and not just the Jews. Oh, yeah, I remember the Bible says that the Gentiles also he will come in. And he starts getting this going on in his mind. And we're going to see here, verse 34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God has shown no partiality. He gets it. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of the, uh, which John priest preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, who they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he who has ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him, will receive the remission of sins. Peter's going to say here, whoever, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13 tells us. And then verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, 
the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. The gospel came to the Gentiles. This is a big deal for you and I. Without this, you and I would have no access to being a Christian. I don't know. Maybe some of you guys are Jewish in here. I don't know. But most of us are Gentiles. And so this is what's happened. The Holy Spirit comes upon these people. You see here, they didn't have to say a prayer. They didn't have to do certain things. They just believed in their mind the moment they believed the Holy Spirit fell on them, just like in Acts 2. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the Gentiles also. What is this? I remember seeing this. Remember a couple, little while ago in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit fell on these people in the upper room, and all these Jews from all over were like, man, these guys must be drunk. They're speaking our language, or babbling around, and Peter comes out, man, no, we're filled. This is a prophecy of Joel, and this and that, and the circumcised are going, is happening. And then verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So these guys get saved, they're baptized, they're in the beloved, and now Jews and Gentiles can mix. And this is why Jesus on Palm Sunday came into Jerusalem. Not to be a political ruler, to overtake the Roman authority, like probably the people laying down the palm branches thought he was going to do, and to free them from that. But no, he came to seek and save that which was lost from every children, from every child to the oldest person, to save them. All they had to do was believe in his name. I want us to turn to Mark chapter 5 real quick. Mark chapter 5. In Acts chapter 2, those people who were um, listening to Peter's sermon all went back to their towns and, and shared the gospel. But there was one Gentile man who did believe in Jesus and who Jesus accompanied before this in Mark chapter 5. I'm going to kind of read through this. It says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, which is Jesus and the apostles, to the country of the Gardarians, uh, Gadarene, Gadarenes, I think. Anyways. Really hard name to pronounce. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When Jesus saw, when he saw Jesus from afar off, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. So we see here, our first response is, Man, this guy like knows who Jesus is and wants to worship him. Well, if you take a deeper look, this is actually the demons speaking to Jesus. And they're saying, you know, they're, doing their mumbo-jumbo, and God's like, hey, no, I'm not about that. That's not something, you're not fooling me. If you can remember, there was a lady following around Paul, I believe in Ephesus in Acts 18. I could be wrong, but there was a lady, uh, like a witch, witchcraft person, following around Paul and saying, these people come in the name of the Lord. They have the truth. They have this. And after three days, Paul got tired of it and said, come out of her unclean spirit. And the unclean spirit came out of her. Man, what discernment we have to have. Because even, you know, even the demons believe and tremble, James, James 2 tells us. Even demons believe in Jesus and tremble. Doesn't mean they're going to obey him, but they believe in him. And so Peter recognizes this guy is saying this. It says, then he asked him, verse 9, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Now, I don't know how much relation this has, but a legion is 6,000 6, people in an army. This is the exact number of people that Cornelius would have been overseeing in his army. And this guy had 6,000 or more demons inside of him. This is a lot. This is crazy. No wonder he can break chains off of things and, and not be shackled. This guy was crazy. And it says, my name is Legion, for we are many. 
Verse 10, also he begged them earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. It was not their demon's time to be cast into the pit of hell. And so they're asking, please, you know, don't do that. And then verse 11, now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us into the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. And a herd ran violently down the steep place in the sea and drowned in the sea. A couple of things we need to mention here. If there are swine around, we know this is a Gentile context. Because again, swine, unclean animal. No Jew would be caught dead with a pig, right? But this is very normal for Gentiles to have a herd of swine. So this is a Gentile place. These are Gentile people. Jesus is coming here. And they, you can see Jesus' command, first of all, over demonic forces. We have this, the same power in us that Jesus has. Um, to control these things, not to be afraid of them. And it says they ran and drowned in the sea. I don't, I don't know. That, that's funny. But verse 14, so those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was uh, that had happened. Then he, they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. A miracle has taken place. This guy who was cutting himself, breaking off things, crying out, no one can bind him, is sitting and clothed in his right mind. A miracle. It says, they were afraid. And it says, and those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him, being Jesus, to depart from the region. Jesus does a miracle, and they ask him to leave. This is all according to God's purpose. It wasn't the time yet for Jesus to make himself known to the Gentiles. Again, he is the Jewish Messiah. He's, he's for Israel. Again, Israel is a chosen people of God. He's for these people. And he sees this happen, and it's not his time yet. But this event happens. And verse 18 says, And when he got in the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him this, this is one of my favorite sentences in Scripture. Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Every Christian in this room can say the same thing about, about God in our lives. What he has done for us and changed us and the compassion he has had on us is overwhelming to people. Verse 20, and he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis, which means 10 cities, all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. It doesn't say they got saved. It says they marveled. It's breaking ground for this. This is the first guy. We don't even know his name. He's known as the demon-possessed man, going and sharing the things that, that, that Jesus had done for him. And we see the Gentiles begin to be reached. Again, so important for us because of our state as Gentiles. And so this is Jesus' purpose on Palm Sunday. Um, we're not going to go to all the accounts, but we're going to hit a few. We're going to close, close here pretty soon. Um, of the accounts of Jesus' triumphal entry, all of them basically say the same thing, but there's a few nuances in a couple of them. Um, so if you want to follow along or write notes, I'm in John chapter 12, verse 12. This is the triumphal entry. John and Mark, their gospel is more chronological, Mark more so. But John, John kind of gives the, more of the order, especially later on in the, in the book. Um, specifically from this point on, the order of Jesus' events on the week before he was crucified. And so this is why we're going to this specific passage. John 12, verse 12, says this, The next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it. As it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey, on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that the things were written about him, that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he had called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. So the chapter of four is the story of Lazarus when he died. 
You know, they sent for Jesus. He was sick. He waited two days, came. He comes to the tomb. Lazarus is dead. Mary and Martha go, why did you wait? If you were here earlier, he'd be alive. And it says, Jesus wept, shortest verse in Scripture. And he said, he said for this purpose, and he says, to, to proclaim the glory of God. And he looks in the tomb. He says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb, raises from the dead. And there's Pharisees and Jewish people around that are, of course, what just happened? Mind blown. And so they're bearing witness to this, and then immediately he goes in Jerusalem the next day for this triumphal entry. It says, verse 18, for this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. So part of the reason that they're so excited is not only because they believed he was the Messiah, but the reason they did is because he did this sign. He rose someone from the dead. This is an amazing sign. It says, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Why would they be accomplishing nothing? Well, because the Pharisees do not like this guy. They're trying to get rid of him. They're trying to um, disdain his name. And it says, look, the world has gone after him. This is our prayer as Christians that we can say, man, you know, California has gone after Jesus or America has gone after Jesus or the world is going after Jesus. This is what they said, man, look at this. Their people are putting clothes in palm branches and, and, and they're worshiping and singing this messianic song and they're praising God. And this is the entry that Jesus had coming in Jerusalem with joy and happiness. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to bounce to Luke 19, um, verses 28 through 40 is the section of the, of the um, uh, triumphal entry. But look at this a little different here. I love, I love Jesus for m- more reasons than one, but this is an awesome. He, he's really good. His comebacks are really good. I wish I was this good, right? He says in verse 39, And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Hey, they can't be worshiping you. That's blasphemy. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And the stones would worship the Lord. If you're silent, I mean, if if they did nothing, dude, like these rocks are going to cry out for Jesus. All creation is mourning, longing for Jesus' return. You know, I was really blessed um, growing up that my family took me on a lot of a lot of camping trips. And I know you guys live in the forest, so it's not like, okay, you know, some of you guys might like it. But, um, you know, I'm from the city, so we didn't get to see a lot. We went to Yosemite, went to Kern River, different places, um, Yellowstone one time. And I got to see the beauty of God. And my dad always reminded us, imagine how beautiful this is right now. This is the world in its fallen state. Oh, man, I cannot wait for when the new birth comes and new creation comes and we see this and maybe we'll just be walking on a trail and a rock's going to cry out. I don't know. That would be awesome. That would be really cool. And so the Jews here doing something right. They see, they recognize this is the Messiah. This is the king coming in, coming in. For what purpose? Well, their thoughts, he's coming in to save us from Rome. Remember, Jew, Israel is under Roman control right now. And they're believing Jesus is coming in for a political purpose. Now, Jesus is coming in for far more than they could even imagine. Imagine telling a Jew on this day, he's coming in, in four or five days, he's going to be nailed to a cross. He's going to die. Three days from that, he's going to be raised. And then the gospel is going to be for everyone. The veil is going to be torn in two. We no longer have to go to the temple. We no longer have to do sacrifices anymore, animal sacrifices. You no longer have to be circumcised to be saved. You no longer have to do all these things to be saved. And guess what? He's also going to be the Savior for the Gentiles. If you were a Jew in that time, you would say, there is no way that would ever happen. But this is the purpose of Jesus' coming. Palm Sunday is a time to remember that, you know, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, into the, 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 the city of the Lord, right? He comes in to die for these people who in just a few days are going to crucify him on a cross. And as we, um, I can, the worship team, you guys can come back up right now. Um, and as we meditate on these things and as we get ready for this Easter um, time to remember what God has done for us, it's good to think back on, man, you know what? My sin put Jesus on that cross. My sin, my wrongdoings, my wickedness 
before I knew him or my disobedience while I know him is what put him on the cross. It's a good reminder, you know, maybe you're struggling with, with sin today. The Lord wants you to know that, hey, there is, there is no temptation that is overtaking you, but God is able to bear it for you. And he's able to help you in any time of need. If you, if you uh, know the Lord today, that's awesome. If you don't know, we would love to pray with you and uh, um, help you come to know the Lord. But just as we sing this last song, just meditate on those things of, man, God, you came to Jerusalem not to overthrow a government, but to die for my soul, that I can be with you for all eternity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you, God, for this time. Lord, we thank you that even what we, we didn't really cover today, but you came in through, through prophecy, writing on a cult, as your word would say, prophesied of this thing that was happening. People singing, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Lord, we just know that you, you came to die for us. You came for every single one of us. You came to die for our past, our present, and our future sins, Jesus. Help us never to shame you in that, in the sense of take that as nothing and sin, thinking that grace may abound. But God, help us to just walk worthy of the calling that you've called us to. Help us to be obedient sons and daughters and children of you. Help us to have a heart of compassion like you did when you see this demon-possessed man raging in the hills and your heart is moved with compassion. When you see Cornelius giving alms and praying with no response because he's not this Jew or he's not circumcised, but you had compassion and you heard him and you sent Simon. Lord, maybe you want to use people in this room that people have been praying for someone to share the gospel with them, someone to share the truth, maybe neighbors or family members or, or anyone coming by. They just, they're waiting for truth and, and you want to use one of us, God. May we never quench the spirit. May we never be disobedient, Lord. Lord, I thank you that you don't condemn us because of our sin or wickedness. But when we repent, you declare us righteous before you, Jesus. And you make us as white as snow. Thank you for coming and saving us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.